So welcome to, to everyone. Um, I'm Leila Halal, the co-director of the Middle East Task Force at New America Foundation. And we um, are very pleased to be hosting this event on Egypt at such a momentous time in the country's uh, history. Um, we, uh, t you know, uh, most of you probably are following uh, Egypt very closely, and so you know that uh, the country has just finished its first round of elections for the People's Assembly. And while there are two more rounds to occur over the next uh, four weeks, um, we, we have a very good idea of the emerging uh, powers and uh, uh, actors in, in the new Egypt. Um, although I hesitate to say new because it's uh, constantly evolving and um, I suppose it's anyone's guess as to where Egypt will end up and it will be most likely quite a while before we, we figure that out. But um, just, I'm gonna provide a few details on the election results um, or the, the first round uh, results in order to allow our distinguished panelists to, to focus more <coughs> on, on analysis. Um, and I will introduce them individually momentarily, but um, um, there, there are, um, so, we, so we have, um, we know the percentages of, or we know the number of votes that have come on in for um, the major parties. Um, we have also had uh, unofficial attempts at calculating the percentages of seats that um, the different parties will take in the, the People's Assembly. Um, these are unofficial results because the procedures for translating votes into uh, seats are, are still unclear um, and there's been no official an announcement as to how or, or what methodology will be used to, to calculate these seats. So um, everything is, is preliminary at this point in time, but for those who, who may not have been able to, to follow the news um, this morning, um, they, the um, cal unofficial calculations put out by some of the uh, press following the vote is that the Freedom and Justice Party, the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, has taken 82 uh, seats in, in the um, parliament. That would put them at 49%. Um, the Salafist um, Al Noor Party uh, is uh, holding an a unofficial tally of 33 seats uh, with 20%. Uh, percent. Now, of course, uh, the Al Noor win, the Salafist win at such a high number is one of the major surprises of, of the elections, emerging from the elections. Um, and between Al Noor and Freedom and Justice, that comes out to a 70% um, uh, in uh, seating of Islamist at the table. But of course, as we will hear, El Noor, uh, Freedom and Justice are, are two different players um, and how they will relate to one another remains a question. Um, the third major party to have uh, taken seats in the, the parliament is the e e Egyptian bloc, um, a coalition of liberals uh, led um, by a, a famous uh, Coptic individual, um, th this Egyptian bloc took a total of, uh, again, unofficial 18 seats with 11% uh, of the overall uh, seats. El Waft has uh, 12 seats um, and Revolution Continues, which is um, reflective of and inclusive of most of the youth parties has uh, five uh, seats with 3% of the parliament. So that's just a, um, a general overall um, um, outline of the, what the People's Assembly uh, will, will look like. Um, but of course, the, what powers it's hold and what, what that means is, is a question. So today um, for our conversation, we have a distinguished panel of, of rule of law experts and political analysts on Egypt. Um, two of our panelists are lawyers, uh, Renda 
uh, Fahmi and Michael Wahid Hanna are both lawyers. Um, Nathan Brown is an expert in constitutionalism in, in the Middle East. So um, we're hoping to have a very good discussion in terms of being able to map out um, who you know the different actors and their their powers in Egypt and the political battles going forward. Um, Renda Fahmi will speak first. Um, she is currently uh, vice uh, president of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association, a group that seeks to uh, provide Egyptian-led support to reform efforts in the country post January 25th. She served in the uh, George uh, W. Bush administration in several energy and economic advisory positions, including as Associate Deputy Secretary of Energy. Uh, Nathan Brown obviously is well known to, to most of you. He's Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University and a non-resident senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, and again, an established expert on constitutionalism in the Arab world, um, as well as Islamist movements in the Middle East. Um, Michael Wahid Hanna is a fellow at the Century Foundation. He is, um, he's a, was a Fulbright scholar in Cairo, amongst his, his many uh, affiliations, past affiliations. His expertise lies, lies in international security, human rights, and U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. He just returned from his seventh trip to Egypt since February 1st and uh, was tweeting his observations, so perhaps many of you followed him. He also um, was quoted in the New York Times in what was, I think, a very salient quote. Um, s describing uh, the new parliament as perhaps an Islamist affair, as liberal, conservative, and um, moderate Islamist forces battle it out. Um, so uh, looking very forward to hearing Michael's impressions of his visit um, and the insights and analysis from our other panelists. Each will speak for about 10 minutes, and uh, then we will open it up for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Layla, and uh, thank you to the New America Foundation for allowing the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association to co-sponsor uh, this event with you and also to provide a little bit of information about Erla because we are a new organization. As Layla mentioned, we are a group of Egyptian American lawyers who believe that our intimate knowledge of the language, culture, history, religious background, and political landscape uh, best suits us to provide legal expertise and advice to a variety of partners, individuals, and organizations on the ground in Egypt. Uh, when we established Erla, and it was only established a mere six months ago, um, our idea was that we would provide as a resource to provide technical assistance to these organizations on the ground who needed our help. Um, our idea was to provide advice and counsel for structural reforms if they wanted our advice on laws that were being drafted, on any kind of uh, particular issue that may touch upon the rule of law, we were there to serve as a, a guidepost, if you will, um, and an advice and counsel uh, organization. We are not, nor do we continue to be affiliated with any party or organization on the ground. We've purposefully stayed away from any of the political ins and outs on the ground, which is quite difficult these days. Um, we believe in the rule of law, and what is the rule of law? You know, it's funny, I hear many of our U.S. government officials throwing around this terminology, particularly when it comes to the Middle East, but in particular when it comes to Egypt, sort of a worrisome sort of thing that somehow a democratic election doesn't ensure rule of law. And according to our principles at Erla, and you can learn more about us, by the way, we do have a website, it's earla.org that government officials are accountable under the law, that the laws are clear, publicized, stable, and fair, and they protect fundamental rights, including the security of persons and property, that the process by which the laws are enacted and enforced is accessible, fair, and efficient, and access to justice is provided by competent, independent, and ethical adjudicators, attorneys, and judicial officers who are sufficient in number 
have adequate resources, and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. And so Erla, our organization, banded together a group of us who took two trips, one in April and the most recent one in July. Our purpose for going over there was really to solidify our partners on the ground. Who was it that needed our help? We did a little of outreach from here, but we did a lot of it when we landed in Egypt. And interestingly enough, we went with the mission, but a mission wasn't guided by us. The mission was guided by many organizations on the ground who were already working on an issue. And it's interesting what particular law they were working on. It was Freedom of Information Act, FOIA law. And many of you may say, well, why FOIA? You know, that seems so esoteric. I was very excited about that and jumped that having served in the US government, knowing what the ins and outs are of a FOIA law and how very important that is to rule of law, transparency, accountability, and corruption, if you will. Uh, we took on that, that, uh, that battle, if you will. And so when we went there in July, we did solidify our partnerships with some very, very well-established, old, and, and you know, very respected non-governmental organizations, human rights organizations, media organizations, because they have much at stake with respect to FOIA. We did meet with political activists to get a sense, women's groups. While we were there, of course, we did stop in and see educational institutions. Uh, we did meet with US NGOs on the ground, including IRI and NDI, to get a sense of their activities. We met with the presidential campaigns of three of the candidates. Um, we did meet with the Egyptian government. We had a very long meeting with SCAF and the Interior Ministry and the Foreign Ministry. We also uh, were fortunate enough to meet with the U.S. Embassy folks there. The ambassador was briefed on our, our, uh, our, our um, efforts there, as well as the British ambassador and the private sector. Uh, we also got a unique insight, I would say, from our families. All of us that were on this delegation, and there were five of us lawyers, um, continually, I think, got a unique insight. One of my colleagues is here today, Khaled El-Gindi, and everybody, I think, uh, got more of a sense of what was going on there uh, from our families than anything. Um, what, what did we learn from this, and how is this affecting what's going on now with the election? Well, what we learned was, to our great pleasure, that these groups on the ground wanted our help, that we were in this unique position of being Americans, yet Egyptian Americans. And so they were, we were very much welcomed with open arms in a way, I would say, that other foreign influences were not welcome. Um, we learned that acceptance of US government money is a huge issue in Egypt right now, particularly among the NGO and human, human rights community. And that's an issue that our organization struggles with because we are funded primarily by the Egyptian American community. Um, that they, are, that they are fearful of foreign influence. And as a result of that, if you do go on our website, we have not chosen to not list our partners uh, by our uh, certain uh, decision within our organization, but also at the request of our partners on the ground. We have not listed them because there is continued harassment of these organizations, and we certainly don't want to put them in any other danger. Now, with respect to the FOIA focus, I'll go into a little bit of detail about where it is right now and what, how it might play out due to the elections. Uh, when we arrived there in July, there were already what I would call three different drafts of a FOIA law that we felt that we could help with and work with. Um, one was drafted by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Many of you know SIPE, along with the United Group, which is an NGO on the ground in Egypt. Another draft was drafted by the World Bank and the team there. And there was also a third draft that had some input from a government institution in Egypt. Um, when we went there to meet with the folks to see how we can help, uh, they were in a variety of different stages with respect to the FOIA law. And we were able, frankly, to give them some advice, in particular about advocacy efforts. So once you have a draft of this FOIA law, how do you think you're going to get this FOIA law drafted? or I'm sorry, passed within parliament. And nobody thought about the advocacy efforts that it takes. It turns out now, as a result of the election, what has happened with these FOIA drafts, if you will, is that the place that they ran up against the obstacle was with the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, the national security exemption. Frankly, not unlike some laws we have here in the United States, from a legal perspective, we're constantly <coughs> bumping up against that national security exemption. They are too. And so now we have helped them kind of think through the process in advocating with, it, with respect to the new parliament, helping them decide 
whether or not a FOIA law is going to be included in a Bill of Rights as a simple and basic statement or within the Constitution itself. And this is going to be very important because, I, again, the basic, pr basic principles of transparency, accountability, anti-corruption, it's the rock bed of what went on there. That's where the security issue falls in there and, of course, the media. Right now, there's a proliferation of new, what I call new free media in Egypt as a result of the revolution. But the question is, how is the existing media going to be able to get access to information they need, particularly in this time? Um, we see a role in the future, in particular for our group, to help these groups on the ground, as I mentioned, with advocacy. You know, it's a big thing. I, you notice I'll keep calling it advocacy and not lobbying because of the ne negative connotations of that. But advocacy is a real area that people on the ground, every group has told us they need. And we're certainly, some of us within EARLA are very well equip equipped to serve in that role and to help with those efforts. We've also had some tremendous meetings with our partners on the ground on independence of the judiciary, something that we leaped at because that's really going to be a strong issue. Much, much work has been done by many organizations, but one organization in particular has done phenomenal work on independence of the judiciary. It just needs to have its groundwork, if you will, and that's the Constitution and Bill of Rights that ensures that. Um, again, we were asked to help drafting in some of the presidential campaigns as well as the organizations are thinking about a Bill of Rights and they've asked us for our advice, certainly advice on writing the Constitution. We think it's important for protection of minority rights, citizenship training, transitional justice. These are the different areas that we hope to work with in the future. Now, what do the elections mean? As I mentioned, you know, now that we are in the midst of you know, the first round going into the second round, you know, from our perspective, and certainly this is a broader issue, not necessarily having to do with Erla, but part of this is for the first time Egyptian expats, including Egyptian expats here in the United States, got to participate in the voting process. It wasn't perfect, but it got done in a matter of months, which is absolutely unthinkable when you would look at the Egyptian bureaucracy, but the people there felt that it was extremely important to have expatriate um, participation. Um, one issue that's going to come up that we're going to help is is this going to be a presidential or a parliamentary system? I mean, we don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. It depends on what happens in the next round of elections and what happens when who's selected to draft the Constitution itself. How can we help, again, on the technical drafting of that? Um, you know, there's also an issue with Sharia law. Um, this has been the one that's been talked about the most, particularly in the political context here in the United States. And we feel that, again, our members in IRLA are uniquely positioned to help with that um, balance, if you will, of where they're going on Sharia law and how maybe to provide advice um, coming from a country in which transparency, accountability, rule of law, protection of minority rights, and freedom of speech is embedded here in our Constitution um, while still able, of course, for everyone to be able to exercise their religious rights freely. Um, so finally, I think I'll wrap up and uh, hand it over to, certainly to Nathan to talk a little bit more about the elect uh, elections itself. But, um, you know, I would just follow up by saying, look, the success of our organization thus far is that we Egyptian Americans are uniquely, you know, positioned to help in the situation. We've gained trust and confidence. We're able to work with these coalitions on the ground. And um, we're hoping to continue to help solidify that absolute strategic relationship between the United States and Egypt. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think we got a very good idea uh, from that presentation sort of what has to happen on a legal and constitutional level. I'm going to take a look really sort of at a political level and to sort of try and take a look and see what is happening on the ground that might help or hinder turning those, those dreams into a reality. Um, over this past summer, I was asked to write a blog piece about kind of general take on, on uh, Egyptian political developments, and I titled it don't worry, be happy. And um, it's now uh, December. It's uh, about six months after I wrote that. Um, and I think I'd now retitle it something like, you don't have to choose between um, being worried and being happy. You should be both. Um, there's real reasons for concern about this transition process. There's still some uh, uh, strong signs for optimism. I'm going to focus on the, on, on the reasons for concern uh, and, and, and focus on what's happened very, very recently and what's about to happen because I see two main uh, uh, causes for concerns. One has to do with sort of the, par the whole parliamentary election process and the likely outcome of that. Um, the, um, the, the strong showing of the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood-led Freedom and Justice Party um, 
it, you know, the, the number of votes that they're able to turn out isn't necessarily a big surprise. What may be a little bit of a surprise is that the, you know, we don't know exactly how the three rounds of voting will turn out, but it is quite conceivable that the Freedom and Justice Party will wind up in the parliament with an absolute majority. Um, um, and the second big surprise has been the ability of the Salafis uh, to turn out the vote. Um, that's not necessary. I mean, th you know, there are all kinds of, of good and bad things about that. I'm not a Salafi or I'm not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, so I guess I would say that uh, in terms of their policy positions, I'm not all that enthusiastic. But for me, the real problem is that this is such a strong showing on the part of the is Islamists that it really risks deepening a polarization among civilian Egyptian political forces and between the um, uh, a civilian parliament and a, and a military leadership that is just not showing any uh, or, or, or is showing some signs about nervousness about the entire process. The odd thing is that the Brotherhood knew it was running into this as a potential problem going in, and and it, um, it, through the summer was trying to send signals essentially that it was hold, going to hold back. They didn't run a presidential candidate, um, and they still say actually up to this day that they are participating in this political process on their traditional slogan of participation, not domination. They don't necessarily want to win, um, and yet they're winning. Um, and my own sense is that they will come to regret this. Other Islamists in the Arab world um, are, I mean, uh, when Hanushi was in town last week, he said this explicitly, that, that they may be setting themselves up for a problem. It reminds me very much of the situation of, uh, uh, conceivably of, uh, of uh, Hamas in the 2006 elections. I tried to interview leaders of Hamas and just asked them, at what point did you realize that winning was a possibility? And when did you decide to go ahead. The first question I got all kinds of different answers to. The second question I got no answer to. There was no, there was no decision on the part of Hamas to decide whether or not they were going to actually pursue the electoral victory. They just went forward. I think some, the, the Brotherhood is being a little bit um, intoxicated by its own success in ways that may come back to haunt it. Now, why is that a problem for Egypt? Um, because the, the, the problem is the, if, if they have this majority in parliament, it will be... In, in a sense, other political forces, non-Islamist political forces, I think will be frightened you know, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to their bones. Any ability of the parliament to sort of press the demo democratization, liberalization uh, 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 program forward will be hampered. And then you've got the very awkward uh, uh, fact that this parliament has very ambiguous powers. In fact, it has almost no exclusive powers. It has one exclusive power. It doesn't have an exclusive power over legislation. When the Constitutional Declaration, uh, which is now governing Egypt, was written, um, it was written in a very, very strange fashion. Essentially, one, uh, we, the, the 1971 Constitution which had been Egypt's governing document until the revolution. Essentially, one-third of it is just kind of hot air, and that was t taken out, you know, all sorts of ideological and uh, language and the uh, you know, importance of, the, of, of family values, this kind of stuff. That was sort of, a lot of that was taken out. Um, um, uh, some of the more authoritarian provisions were taken out, but one of the things that was surgically removed was the ability of the, pow of, of the parliament to have any kind of, or, 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 uh, of, of oversight of the executive. And so it's not quite clear what the parliament's power is over, say, forming government, over questioning ministers, and that sort of thing. It's not clear that it's completely absent either, because one of the things that the Constitutional Declaration did was reaffirm pre-existing legislation. So the parliament's prerogatives are there in legislation, they're just not in there in constitutional text. And already the Brotherhood and the SCAF are kind of squaring off about what it is that this document actually means um, in ways that I think will, you know, have, you're already seeing some, 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 uh, a positioning on that issue. If both sides, uh, you know, are true to past patterns, they won't pursue this to full confrontation. Uh, but uh, and they probably will come to some kind of accommodation, but it will be a little bit of a nervous one. Now, there is one thing, as I said, that is unambiguous in the Constitutional Declaration. It's exclusively a parliamentary prerogative, and that is naming the 100 people who will draft Egypt's constitution. And that is one thing that the military is making clear that it doesn't really want them to do. It wants basically this to be some kind of consultative process where people are brought in from different parts of Egyptian society. And essentially what the military seems to be trying to do is 
to hem in a right that they had early given to, uh, to the parliament, perhaps as they see the shape that the parliament takes place, and perhaps as they wake up to some of the implications of the document that they themselves wrote, uh, which they didn't seem to be paying enough attention to as they were writing it. Um, the second cause for concern has to do with the sequence going forward. And again, what we have is a SCAF that I think was a little, or, and its legislative drafters that were a little bit a, 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 asleep at the switch when this, when this document was written. The document, the Constitutional Declaration and, and, and the SCAF statements before the Constitutional Declaration implied a clear sequence. You would have parliamentary elections, you would then have presidential elections, you would then have a constitutional referendum. And what the SCAF tried to do, as, because, well, what the SCAF tried to do is to reverse those, uh, those last two stages. Um, and the reason was very, very clear. In the Constitutional Declaration, uh, I'm the only one on this panel who's not a lawyer, but I'm going to get into some legal detail, so stop me when I, when, I, when I say something stupid. But in the Constitutional Declaration, um, it basically has a SCAF assuming all the powers of a really souped up presidency, and the Egyptian presidency even prior to this constitutional declaration was not an unimpressive uh, institution. So it's got the it's powers of the presidency and then some until there are presidential elections, at which point the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces becomes the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, what it always was, essentially the you know, Supreme Body uh, sort of overseeing the military. It turns into... Um, a constitutional pumpkin at the day that the, that the new president is inaugurated. And that means that they lose control over the entire process. So the last thing that seems that, that they want to do is to have the constitution written after they've gone, uh, gone back to the barracks. And so they, they're basically trying to extend their own welcome a little and essentially play with the timetable that is implied, although not required, by the March Constitutional Declaration. It is true that one of the, th the one real concession that the demonstrations in Tahrir recently got was a pledge by the military to have presidential elections in March of, of 20, excuse me, in June of 2012. But what they did not pledge was to do that before the Constitution was written. It's not clear that they've given up on their sequence. The sequence as it is for writing the new Constitution is incredibly rushed. Uh, they're supposed to do it in six months and then present it to voters, and the voters are supposed, there's, there's no opportunity for review or discussion. Basically, you just go straight to the polls. It seems that there is a possibility that they will try to compress that process even more. So that what you've got is perhaps another kind of you know, possible train wreck in the making over the SCAF's attempt to dominate the Constitution writing process. So what we have, essentially, um, and here I'm going to um, try and put my, shift gradually back to my be happy hat, um, what we have is a bad transition process that is being badly executed. Do those two cancel each other out? Does, that what, does, does a bad policy badly executed lead to good result? Um, I'm not sure, but I, I, I haven't given up hope. Let me talk about two kinds of developments that are sort of happening on the side um, that um, I think are worth paying attention to that may put uh, at least a little bit of, uh, of, of a happier spin on things. Number one is that the Egypt which this process is being played out in is just a different place than the Egypt of pre-2011. And we have certainly seen the sort of the politics of public demonstrations and of huge masses, ra mass rallies in Tahrir Square. I think those days may be numbered if they, if they haven't already gone. But what we do have within Egyptian society is a much more highly politicized and organized society, not in any coherent way, but a whole... <clears throat> A, a whole series of groups within Egyptian society that have, for the first time, found a political voice. I shouldn't say for the first time. It's been happening gradually over the last decade, I think. But increasingly, since, especially since January 2011, really found a way to be able to articulate their demands. And they'll now have new venues in which to push. Um, they'll be able to demonstrate at the parliament. They'll be able to demonstrate at the cabinet. They'll be, uh, you, you, my guess is you'll see workers, labor unions, lawyers, and so on, forcefully pushing forward their demands. And to try and put an authoritarian lid on this kind of new, more politicized political system, I think will be very difficult. This is just a society that's going to be a little bit more difficult to dominate than in the past. And the second positive spin, um, 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 and, and, and here I may be grasping at straws, and uh, Mike may, Mike, Mike may uh, uh, tell me I should wake up, but has to do with something involving the performance of Salafis in, in, in the election. This is cause for concern domestically, and it's cause for concern internationally. Um, and I think for good reason. 
Um, but, the, but, but there is something very interesting going on if you take a long-term perspective. And what I'm going to do here is, sw I mean, switch from Egypt to other places in the Arab world. People talk about the Salafis never having been interested in politics before. That's not quite true. They did have some political agenda. And it's also true that in other Arab states, you've had Salafis been in, being involved in politics and electoral politics for quite some time. Um, the place where I've seen it the most is in Kuwait. And I realize like, I'm between two Egyptian Americans and sort of saying that Egypt has something to learn from Kuwait might be like telling an American you have something to learn from the Guatemalan experience. It just, <laughs> the sentence doesn't make sense. So, so I'll ask your patience for just a minute. Um, but um, um, uh, in, in Kuwait, where the Salafis have basically been involved in parliament and elections since the 1980s, something very interesting has happened to them over the long term. Um, and that is to say that they've become, not simply, you know, there's a process of, of, of winning some seats in parliament, make you more enamored of democracy. You become more democratic when people start to vote for you. That, that, that I think, has happened. But it also means that in order to get anything done, you've got to learn to work with other people, which has never been the Salafi strong suit. And it leads to some interesting religious debates within the Salafis. The first time you had a woman cabinet minister in Kuwait, the first time you had women parliamentarians in Kuwait, the Salafis had to deal with the fact that they, that, that if they went by their religious teachings, these women should not have positions of public authority. On the other hand, they were sitting there in the parliament, and what, the, what were they supposed to do? If they wanted to question the minister of education, they would have to, they don't have to look the minister in the eye, but they at least have to talk to her. And it actually led to some, to some ideological and religious development on their part. The last time I was in Kuwait, I interviewed two of the members, women members of parliament, and I just asked them point blank, what's it like working with Salafis? Will they look you in the eye? Will they shake your hand? Hand, will they do this? Shaking the hand was out of the question, but looking them in the eye was not, and actually trying to reach for um, across uh, the gender divide on specific pieces of legislation was not either. This is a process of politicization of the, of the Salafis that if it takes place over the long term, I think will be a healthy development for a part of Egyptian society that, that as, as I said, was really operating as a, as, a, as a society apart from the main society. Over the long term, that's good. The only question is, whether anybody has any ability to focus on the long term at a, at a time of short-term crises. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I might just take a moment to step back to have a look at sort of how we got here, because I think it's important to understand what these elections mean. Uh, and I think we have to go back to uh, January, February, and March uh, to understand how this roadmap came about and what elections mean for the process going forward. Uh, and the reason I say that is because it was at that point in time when what looked like an uprising that could have been a revolution was diverted along the way. Uh, and I think that's partly due because there was a real crisis of political leadership in Egypt, and it's one that, that remains with us. Uh, and it ran both ways. It ran, first and foremost, from the protest movement and uh, those who mobilized in the streets, uh, who evinced a constant distrust of authority, uh, and, and their revolution being hijacked. Uh, and, and that made things very problematic in terms of translating uh, mass political demands on the street into political action. Uh, and, and it manifested itself continually in terms of the SCAF not having an interlocutor to deal with or feeling that they did not. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is a lot of uh, these political groups now uh, come out of what, are, uh, what is a discredited political milieu. Uh, and there was never an ability of political leadership to marry uh, their own views uh, with those in, in the street. Uh, we saw attempts by various people to do this, uh, and it never worked. Uh, and so what we had was a process that got diverted into electoral politics at a time when rev revolutionary goals were not met. Uh, and uh, this suited SCAF. They are a stability-oriented stability uh, organization. Uh, and they think along authoritarian lines. Radical change is not on their agenda. That being said, they don't control the agenda as well. Uh, and when faced with consistent opposition political force uh, united, they've backed down repeatedly. That didn't happen mainly because the process shifted very quickly to politics, which is fine in terms of wanting to see the establishment of a de democratic political process. Uh, but what that did was abort the possibility for very far-reaching quick change. We're now looking at democratic politics over the long haul, perhaps making some of the changes that might have been possible at a much earlier stage. Uh, and, and, I, and, and part of that, part of the fault here, I will say very explicitly, does lie with the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Uh, Nathan talked about when they decided that they could win elections. And I think it was much, I think it was conscious. They did slip into it. Uh, but they, at a very early stage, uh, after the constitutional declaration that Nathan described, uh, after that referendum process, they made a pretty clear decision that emergency law, military trials, security sector reform, huge issues that had animated the, the protest movement were secondary concerns. What mattered to them was the elections. Uh, now, uh, they will defend themselves and say, this was the quickest path to transition. Uh, and there is some truth to that. Uh, but what it did was uh, diverted attention to a different type of process. And so that's, that's sort of the background of how we are here. Uh, I would have expected at a transitional moment in a country's history, which come about very rarely, that political leaders might have thought slightly more than and broader than institutional self-interest. And I think that didn't happen in Egypt, and I think it's a, a, a recurring problem and one that will stick with us. Um, now we look at the results now. I, I just came back from Egypt yesterday, uh, and obviously Nathan touched on the Salafis, and I think the Brotherhood is at expectations. Uh, they shot for 40%, they're going to be above that, uh, because these next two rounds they will perform better. They're less hospitable uh, territory for some of the liberal parties. So I think we will see Islamist numbers going up in these next two rounds. Um, but it's the Salafis, and, and, and Nathan touched on this as well, but their performance um, in the list vote in the very uh, before individual candidates brought them a little bit back down to earth. They were at 25% vote, and that includes Cairo, uh, which is, should be the sort of, uh, the, the sort of uh, best electoral district for, for liberal parties. Uh, and so the Salafis have created quite a bit of concern and shock. Uh, and it does now raise the prospect, again, about what are the Muslim Brotherhood's intentions. They have a very clear uh, hold on where parliamentary politics uh, and the electoral and political discourse goes. They don't need liberals to govern. Um, and if they so chose, they can now order politics around a, what is essentially an intra-Islamist affair. And I think that would be very bad for Egypt. Uh, and uh, I hope that that's not the decision they make. Uh, they have made some noises in recent days that they will not uh, align with in a coalition with the Salafis, uh, and I think that's hopeful. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us about what they will do going forward. Um, they have coordinated with the Salafis in these election campaigns. Uh, they've tried to split up some districts. It's been a somewhat acrimonious relationship. They've had a long time suspicion. Uh, Salafis has long uh, uh, sus had suspicion for the MB because of their dedication to the political process, which was seen by some of them as a corruption of their, uh, uh, of their religious ethos. Uh, so this, this is a key dynamic. What, what does the Mus Muslim Brotherhood choose to do? Uh, does it choose to ally with Salafis, even tactically? Uh, and some of this might be driven by what are the really insoluble issues facing Egypt? Uh, when faced with really big problems, uh, a lot of times politics gets pushed to culture. If you need quick wins, and this parliament will eventually need that, uh, my big concern is that we see culture issues rise to the fore. So people can actually say, we've done X, X, and X. You voted for us, and we've been able to do something. Egypt's economy is in desperate trouble. Uh, and in those circumstances, one could see a turn to populism and, and easy culture war issues. Um, go back one more step uh, in, in looking at the liberal parties. Um, they didn't do particularly well. It wasn't a complete disaster, uh, but they don't have the wellsprings of organizational infrastructure to fall back on uh, that the Islamist parties do. So to some extent, it was always going to be very difficult. Um, this has been exacerbated by liberal infighting, a uh, lack of coordination, a lack of tactical sophistication in terms of how to approach and exploit the political system. Uh, and so we've seen some of those problems uh, manifesting themselves in various electoral districts where uh, I think liberals cannibalized their vote, ran too many candidates, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's a, uh, a function of what is, has been really dysfunctional politics on, on that side. Uh, 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 that side. Um, the liberal parties will also now, I think, be faced with a very distasteful prospect, which is what their position will be with respect to the former NDP, the former ruling uh, regime party. Uh, in talking to former NDP folks in Egypt, they've always had a very uh, uh, sanguine uh, position about their future uh, and thinking that these liberal parties will come back to us uh, because they will be stuck between the military and Islamists 
uh, and coordination and cooperation with us is going to make too much sense. Uh, and so this is something that has been very controversial for liberal parties uh, and was part of the fragmentation, I think, in terms of forming these electoral lists, in terms of inclusion of former NDP figures, uh, but it's something that we will see again on the agenda going forward. Uh, and of course, these sorts of divisions that we see help the SCAF, they help the military. Uh, the military can then triangulate between liberal parties and Islamist parties uh, and offer each side inducements. Uh, and I think continuing the fragmentation that we've seen and limiting the ability of these forces to work together now to do what is very important, which is to dislodge the military from the political process. Uh, and so, uh, you know, can these political parties uh, set aside some of these very big substantive differences to work on this also very important agenda, and I think that's yet to be seen, frankly, and I'm, I'm fairly skeptical uh, of, of uh, the ability of the parties to do that. Um, one last thing I would just point out, I think there's three very important things that we will see very quickly uh, and will give us an indication about, I think, the Brotherhood's intentions and how they think about this transitional period. Uh, Nathan mentioned some of them, uh, but government formation. Uh, the SCAF has made very clear that the parliament does not have the ability to appoint this next government. The MB has said that they, the parliament should be able to do this. Uh, second is the uh, constitutional assembly. Uh, the same sort of dynamic is at work, and so I think it's going to be very important to see whether the Brotherhood takes uh, an approach of frontal confrontation with the SCAF, which they have not done to this point. Um, they have eschewed that and have instead sought to work with them. Uh, or whether they go back to negotiate. Uh, and I think we will get a sense of how the MB thinks about its, uh, its position in the transition, I think, from, these, from its approach to these two issues. And of course, lastly, is the Constitution. They've been very coy about what they want from the Constitution. Um, they've rejected what have been called these super constitutional principles, uh, ostensibly on the basis that the military has no right to intervene in such affairs and that this is the prerogative of the parliament. What they haven't been clear about is what they want the Constitution to look like. And I think what we don't know is what if the Brotherhood remains a uh, conservative, committed movement that sees itself primarily in social, broad social terms, in terms of an incremental social project, uh, and whether that still, uh, that's still an accurate description for how they want to see uh, their transformation of Egyptian society. If that's the case, they'll take a somewhat different approach to the Constitution. And Article 2, which says that the Sharia is the main source of, of legislation in Egypt, will be enough. Uh, but we don't know if that's the approach they're going to take or if they have more uh, nakedly uh, uh, Islamist ambitions for the document. And so I think that's another one of these things that we will see very early on uh, that will give us an indication, I think, of how the Brotherhood uh, wants to play its role in this transition. Uh, and I emphasize the Brotherhood because, frankly, they are the pivotal player in, in this, um, along with the military. And, and so their decisions have outsized weight going forward. OK, um, before opening to uh, the floor for questions, I, I want to make um, one common observation. Um, what I, you know, we had these major revolutions in uh, Tunisia and Egypt where people took to the streets and um, all of us watched in excitement and shock as um, authoritarian regimes that were very entrenched fell. And the excitement of that moment was really that you had people that were just ordinary people claiming power for themselves. And in that moment, um, there was a sense that what was at stake was um, not um, perhaps what we're discussing now, but perhaps um, you know, prospects and uh, demands for uh, dignity, uh, social justice, and inclusion. Um, and instead of, of talking about how to sort of reform social contracts in Tunisia and Egypt, we're now talking about um, what will the Islamists do? And what, what are the poli power politics around um, the, the Brotherhood, around Anahda? And, and I, I just want to make a, a comment that I find this um, a rather unfortunate um, development. I think both Anahda and uh, the Brotherhood were accidental uh, beneficiaries of these revolutions. Um, 
they were able to be successful um, because people, of course, trusted their their morality and trying to overcome the um, the corruption of the prior regimes. People, I think, probably felt the Brotherhood and Ahda, these Islamist parties, will bring ethical principles to the table. But they were also very effective in um, uh, taking advantage of the competitive. Uh, vote. Um, Michelle Dunn, I heard her speak recently. She was an official observer of the elections in Egypt. She said that um, what she noticed is that people, when they went to vote, um, they didn't know who to vote for. Um, and the campaigning, which was supposed to have stopped prior to 48 hours prior to, to the vote, um, continued. And people were, the, you had aggressive campaigning. Um, while people were at the polls. I, I think that um, w w w the point of this is to say that you know, while we are engaged in a discussion of the Brotherhood and uh, the Islamist and, and their power grab, um, in fact, there's an underlying agenda at play in these societies um, that, that uh, have been led by the revolutionary forces. And I don't think that those that their agenda will die out. But the question is, how will it be articulated? And will this, uh, this struggle between uh, secularism and Islam overcome uh, that agenda? Um, and I want to ask a question which uh, Nathan sort of um, provoked. Um, Nathan, you said that the, the optimism is that there are all these vocal forces, the labor movements, uh, uh, NGOs, um, syndicates, that will continue to force their agenda. Um, but who will they force it towards? Um, what, what, uh, what is the mechanism now, and who is the counterpart to, to demand change? Is the only option to go back to Tahrir and, and demand a, a full and complete revolution? Um, and then the second question is for all the panelists, and that's related to US foreign policy. The US provides uh, 1.3 billion, um, in, in, uh, 1.2 billion in annual average assistance, average annual military assistance to Egypt. Um, the U.S. is a major power in uh, in, in Egypt, and um, it's so far been relatively quiet in addressing SCAF's continued hold and assertion of, of power long term. It made a statement calling for transfer to civilian rule, but it hasn't really specified um, what its policy is, and SCAF hasn't specified a date for its transfer of, uh, for the holding of presidential elections. So given you know, this vague and messy scenario and the US important role, you know, what, what should the US policy be going forward? Thank you. Um, if I can, before I take that question, if I could talk about um, just the accountability and sort of who you or where Egyptians can focus their efforts towards. Um, I think on the, you know, Nathan Brown's optimism is SCAF is interestingly um, amenable to what I would say suggestions or changes. And two of those examples certainly are with respect to the latest protests in Tahrir Square and solidifying the presidential elections. But the other one that I have personal experience is, is these right of Egyptian expats to vote. I mean, we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied, including the SCAF, and they were amenable to those changes based upon public pressure. I also think SCAF and the parliament you know, and if it is the Brotherhood, that's the dominant force there, and it will be probably, are going to be amenable to these types of activities. And now that the media is free, they can go out and write what they want. They're going to be sensitive to that in Parliament. Uh, again, the protests in Tahrir Square, nobody can stop that. You know, nobody can stop the power of 90 million Egyptian citizens. And also this ad the advocacy efforts. That's why what I was talking about, advocacy and advocating on behalf of what their interests are in front of parliament is going to have to become a newfound profession, if you will, in Egypt. Um, back to with the US policy. Well, you know, as we all know, with respect to US government assistance, it's not just the administration who has the purse strings. I know from having worked in Congress, it is Congress. And, you know, I think Congress is probably just as curiously lost as the administration is on this. Um, you know, Congress is often driven by political motivations. And all they know right now is that some scary Islamist parties may be in power in Egypt without really knowing 
and really wanting to know anything further about what those policies are, and they probably don't because the Brotherhood doesn't know how they're going to govern. Um, and so I think we're, I think that Congress is in a wait and see attitude, that they're purposefully withholding the appropriate aid before they see what happens, whatever what happens is, and that the Obama administration is really in serious talks about where they're going with this, having to be very careful, by the way, because frankly, a lot of folks in Egypt think that the Obama administration is speaking out of both sides of their mouth. You know, on one hand, they were really, really sitting on the fence when the revolution first occurred and supporting a longtime 30, 40 year ally. And yet, on the other hand, they talked about freedom and democracy, and Obama gave this great speech in Cairo. And, you know, when I talk to a lot of the youth, what they said to me is, we don't think Obama is any different than George Bush is. I mean, a lot of that uh, uh, opinion is permeating. And so I see a lot of this, frankly, talking out of both sides of their mouth on this issue. And that's, you know, I'm not in power right now, but that's a real difficult position to be in. Let me uh, turn uh, to your comment uh, first, and also I want to sort of respond. I, I agree with all of the analysis that I've heard so far, but I want to push back actually a little bit on on tone, because I think there's something that uh, that I do disagree with in tone, much less in substance, with what uh, Mike said and with, with your comment, because it almost sets up sort of a principled revolutionaries versus power politicking brotherhood. And I don't think that's the best way to look at it. It's not not because I mean you know my own political sympathies would be far more with the revolutionaries than with the Brotherhood, the, but the Brotherhood has its clear principles as well. It's they're they're, they're acting in, a, in in a principle as well as a purely political manner. And the revolutionary, I mean, I talked to plenty of people on the liberal and secular side of the, uh, 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 of the spectrum, or people who were involved in the revolution who said point blank that their major concern, for instance, about moving to elections very quickly was um, that it would basically uh, lead to an Islamist victory. So everybody was playing pretty hard politics from the beginning. Um, the... Um, 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 and, and everybody had their principles as well. I, I mean, I don't see a, w a way to distinguish among the various groups that way. Um, in terms of where these groups go it, to uh, position themselves in the um, or, or to press their demands, one of the big problems about the the the, the uh, uh, current uh, Egypt's current political. Uh, uh, status is, in a sense, authority is kind of unclear. It's, it's clear that the SCAF has ultimate uh, decision-making power. It's not quite clear what the cabinet can do, what individual ministries can do, this Gonzori government, which, you know, um, is supposed to be, you know, gi given given some additional uh, uh, constitutional authority with an amendment of the constitutional declaration. Um, and that's going to be a problem for these groups. I suspect we'll see some evolution in this. It has been the case that if you could, if you could get everybody together in Tahrir, you could probably push the SCAF. It's also true that if you had kind of a non-security related demand, you could probably push the SCAF a little bit. Um, but there will be a new venue, and that'll be the parliament. And um, the parliament it does not have exclusive right over legislation, but it does have an. It, it will be able to write laws. And I suspect that an awful lot of the groups have been focusing their attention so far on how it is that they want the legal framework for their sector of society to be governed. So the parliament will be, I, th I suspect, I mean, it was even under the old um, rubber stamp parliament a place for people to hold demonstrations in the, in the last years of the Mubarak regime. And so I suspect you'll see basically various groups, you know, having sort of a, a menu of choices um, um, and, uh, and you know, they can, they can demonstrate at the cabinet, they can demonstrate at the parliament. If they're really gutsy, they can go straight to the SCAF, but that's kind of, that can be kind of uh, dangerous. In terms of foreign policy, I mean, I agree kind of with what you said about how we're perce perceived in Egypt. To me, the real question for the Obama administration is not simply how to have a dialogue with the SCAF and what to say, but where to say it. And what we've seen, I think, very recently is a willingness to move uh, a couple things that were expressed privately into the public realm. Um, and, and the statement essentially on the transition to civilian rule was fairly tough message to send, um, at, least to, um, a, a, at least to the SCAF. I don't know if it was heard by the broad Egyptian public that way. Uh, it may have been kind of a little bit uh, subtle to uh, uh, communicate <laughs> in terms of public diplomacy. Um, uh, but to me, it's, it's sort of the question is not simply, you know, as I say, uh, where you push uh, 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 but but how hard you push and how publicly you push. Um, to touch on SCAF, I mean, I, I would never talk about SCAF being amenable to anything because they're not. Um, SCAF is uh, terrified of street protests. They understand that they can't 
they actually have, it's a sort of Wizard of Oz scenario. They can't control security in the country. Uh, police aren't back out in for, force. Uh, they fear foreign agendas is what is stirring up what is non-Islamist mobilization. Mobilization to them in, in mass terms can only be an Islamist phenomenon. And so their alarm bells go off when there are hundreds of thousands of people in the street and the Islamists aren't involved. Um, and, and we've seen that, yes, they will change tack, but they only do so when, again, hundreds of thousands of people are out in the street and the entire opposition and political class is unified. That doesn't happen very often. Um, when those things happen, sure, they do. They, they, they're bad authoritarians. They change their mind all the time. They, they have trial balloons. They change their mind in three days and come out with three different positions. Um, they're pretty incoherent. Their roadmap has been incoherent. But um, they only respond to that. Uh, and, and that's a difficult place to put your politics. And it affected how the transition played out because people were suspended between politics of a normal variety and protest. Uh, and, and you saw this tension, uh, and particularly among some of the liberal groups, with people saying, why are you doing this? Go organize. You're getting uh, beaten up by the Brotherhood. You're going to lose these elections. And yet the only way for course corrections to happen was by this very public form of protest. So that dynamic, I don't know that it's finished. I, I think it's not. I mean, I think it's, 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 uh, there's too much at stake still and unknown in the transition. Uh, and this has clearly been a way to change the SCAF's mind. So I imagine that I, I don't think Tahrir is dead in, in the sense that I think we will see further uh, public protest. Um, the, the other thing about Tahrir to remember, it was always a minority movement. It was a minority movement on February 11th, and it was a minority movement on February 12th. Um, state media is hugely, yes, there's free media, state me media, Mass Bureau, is hugely influential and can move minds uh, and can rally support behind institutional governmental positions. Um, the si the so-called silent majority is important, but it is, I think it's, it's it's important, one, to realize that it is a majority, I think, but two, that a committed minority who's willing to organize and be out on the streets does have outsized influence. So that, that's an, it's an important dynamic, one, to realize where Tahrir and the protest movement fits in the bigger picture, um, but also that, that I don't, it's not, it still is not a, a majority position. There's a lot of fatigue with protest. Um, lastly, on, on U.S. foreign policy, I think part of it, as Nathan was alluding to, was wh who and how they were addressing uh, the issues. Uh, and part of that was the theory of the case. The case was, we have strong ties with SCAF. They're the only party able to bring about a transition. Uh, we need to hold them close at a time of uh, instability. Uh, and uh, if we do not, if we go out in public with this, uh, then we give SCAF an out to talk about foreign meddling. That has been the theory of the case. Um, one problem with that is it looks like Mubarak redux. It looks like we are signed off on whatever SCAF wants to do. Uh, and so even from a perception standpoint, I think that's a problematic place to be. And so I think shifting a little bit and cl making clear what our red lines are is important. And, and not so much, I think, even because I think it can change policy. I think SCAF is pretty dead set. And they're not budging on military trials. They're not budging on emergency law. But at the very least, to create some defense uh, for the accusation of, of outright hypocrisy, that we are now, we've learned nothing from the past 10 months and that we're simply taking a position as we were before Mubarak fell. And so I think it's important to note what our red lines are. Now that brings back, uh, brings out another question about what, what happens when those red lines are crossed. And I think that's a much more difficult issue because straight up conditionality is, is a very blunt tool to use in terms of what is an important relationship. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we, we have just a sh short amount of time, 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to take uh, several at one time. Um, we'll start in the back of the room here. Um, Anna? Hi, I'm Anna Newby with the Project on Middle East Democracy. My question is for <laughs> Professor Brown. Um, you wrote an interesting article last week sort of arguing that the Muslim Brotherhood kind of succumbed to temptation by seeking additional parliamentary seats, um, but that in the meantime they may have sort of acquired too much power for their own good. Um, looking ahead to presidential elections, the Brotherhood has sort of repeatedly insisted that they're not seeking the presidency, but at this point it's kind of anyone's guess. Um, what would it mean for Egyptian politics if the Brotherhood fielded a candidate for the presidency? Okay. Um, gentleman in the back in the red. Jack Warner at the Institute for Sustainable Power. Is it too early now to start to identify really key individuals in these parties, in the military, in the parliament, that are going to lead the fight for the Constitution and are actually going to be, you know, become 
you know, through the election process, you know, in power, either as president or in very critical positions. I mean, we're talking parties, but let's start finding out if there are key individuals now that are emerging that we can really identify. Okay. And just a side note, irony is on the association, if you're doing FOIA and you're doing a transparency and you can't identify your own partners, it's not good. You can't use the, co you can't use the cover of safety and so Thank forth because you. you're out there working we, with your we, partners. we got the point. Thank you. Um, we, we're going to come to the front of the room here. We have uh, one gentleman here. Hi, um, I'm Rusul Shihab, a former NDI uh, employee and also originally from Iraq. Uh, my question is, what do we expect from this um, new government, especially the parliament, in terms of their foreign policy, either in the Arab Middle East countries and internationally? Uh, can I put it a little bit specific? What is, is, are we expecting any change in terms of Egypt-Israel relation? Also, I would add, what is um, going to be the relation with Iran? Thank you. Okay, and uh, we had one up here. Yeah. Oh, Mark Johnson, Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm interested in the assessment of the emerging role structurally for um, civil society organizations, April 6th, etc. What's their role in this political process? My. Okay. Now that's. Uh, that Panelist answer. Okay, um, I'll take the question on um, identifying of key individuals who will probably emerge to um, be in this council, if you will, of 100 folks. Um, I think there are individuals uh, where we can certainly focus our work on that will probably emerge to be individuals who will sit on that council. Um, some of it will come, of course, from the existing political parties who are victorious. Others, and we've certainly heard this from SCAF, uh, who's in control of the process right now, may not be later, but that there will be individuals from the outside. And what does that mean? The outside means groups in civil society. Uh, NGOs, leaders. I, this is not a new field. There have been individuals that have been doing this work for 10, 15, 20 years, some of them, frankly, who sat a lot of time in jail as a result of their activities. And so the, the, these are individuals that are well known to the Egyptian society and community and have a reputation and long standing history for doing this kind of work. And I don't think it would be any big secret. I don't think anybody's out there, nor are we, ready to identify those individuals. But uh, a lot of that work is being done behind the scenes. As far as transparency and accountability, yeah, we wish we could identify our partners. But the reality is, in this environment right now, and maybe it will become better after the presidential elections and things become clearer, we're happy to ID our partners. But our partners suffer things that we don't suffer sitting here in the United States and have for many years. And we don't want to put them under any jeopardy. I don't think it's giving anybody any knowledge or basis to say who these partners are. All we have to know is that they've agreed to work with us and that we're providing with advice and counsel that has been extraordinarily valuable to them for their work on the ground. Um, let me focus most of my response on the question about uh, presidential elections. Um, it, the Brotherhood's position is that they will not run a candidate. They've said that over and over. They've never said that they wouldn't support a candidate, however. And I think that it's that that is probably most likely going to be their position. If you look at it from the Brotherhood's perspective, um, it seems to me what they what we know now is that they perhaps in a uh, you know can can turn out you know something like a, a third of the Egyptian electorate. Um, that doesn't mean that they can elect a candidate on their own, especially if everybody else is allied against them. But it does mean that they can be kingmaker, and that's a very attractive position. And it's actually something that they've done, for instance, in professional association elections some, at, at times. To say, we'll take the board, we'll have the head of the professional association be somebody from outside the movement, but we'll, who will be elected with our support. So that's the pattern that I would still expect to be repeated. But the question was, what would it mean if they actually did um, uh, succumb to temptation, or as I said, get become intoxicated. These aren't great, great metaphors for an Islamist movement. Um, 
but uh, but but let's just say that they did. Um, uh, yeah, yeah intoxicate on too much juice. Yes, um, um, I think it would further the polarization very very deeply, and my hunch is it would make the rest of the political system and perhaps even you know um, um, the uh, uh, scaf itself swing or swing behind another a presidential candidate. I don't know that, um, but but you know it, that might bring the rest of the. In, in a sense, we've never had an election in Egypt in which sort of the state apparatus was neutral. And if basically the state apparatus swung in support of, a, of somebody other than a Brotherhood candidate, it would hard, be hard for me to see that Brotherhood candidate winning. So, uh, um, but that's, you know, I'm just sort of uh, playing this out. That's my guess is what would happen. And I, but it's also important to, to remember that we don't really know what this presidency is post-revolution. Even in the Constitutional Declaration, it's not quite clear w exactly what the authority of the presidency is, so it's not clear how much of a prize this is to be uh, to be won. Very quickly, the question about uh, uh, foreign policy in the new parliament, I expect that there won't be one, right? Because the parliament has very uncertain legislative authority to begin with to try and legislate. I mean, our Congress tries to legislate foreign policy and usually has, does kind of a clumsy job. I don't expect a new parliament to be able to do so easily. I expect that there will be plenty of thunder from the parliament, what the sort of, like uh, Hannah talked about, co sort of going to cultural politics, yes, and going to foreign policy will also be fun to give kind of all sorts of speeches on, 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 on these kinds of issues. But I don't expect them to have, at least over the short term, much impact on the, on the actual policy of the country. Uh, yeah, like Nathan, I think I would be shocked if the Brotherhood fielded a candidate. I think that's an institutional red line that they are simply not going to cross. I think they understand that that would be a, a real shock to the system in a way that would be uh, really detrimental. Um, in terms of key individuals, I think the presidential candidates are one pole of power. Uh, in that uh, field, I still think Amr Musa is very well positioned to, to, to win elections. Uh, I think, you know, they, they still see themselves as the front runner, I think. Uh, there are a constellation of other individuals like Mohammed al-Baradai uh, and Salim al-Awa and some of the other presidential contenders that I think, uh, and Abdel Manam Ibn al-Futuh, the former Muslim brother, um, there are some key political leaders emerging, but it's also, it's a very, uh, it's a very difficult process. Uh, Egypt is a very hierarchical, rigid society. There's a huge generation gap, I and mean, this is something that I think we'll see play out over the next uh, years and decades, really. It's a huge generation gap across the board in all Egyptian institutions. We do see it uh, in Egypt's politics, and it's one of the reasons why I think there's been a disconnect between uh, some younger people who uh, led some of the street protests uh, and the political parties and political institutions. Um, uh, like Nathan, I don't think we will see huge shifts in foreign policy positions. Uh, I, don't, I don't think Camp David, nothing is going to happen to it. The, the military is going to have, regardless of how it plays out, the military will have a very important say in, how, in foreign policy decisions. We're not going to see abrupt strategic shifts, but what we have seen already is that public opinion in Egypt now matters. Uh, and if you're Israel, that's a really different calculation to make. You used to be able to take for granted that the Mubarak government would support your, uh, your positions. Uh, cast led in uh, post-uprising Egypt, that's a very different reaction. Uh, and I think something that, that Israel will have to take into consideration. In terms of civil society, there's a lot of uh, civil society groups now. Um, some of them are oscillating between wanting to be political groups, and we've seen people from April 6th running for office. Uh, some people want to be grassroots organizations. So I think there's going to be, and of course there's some of the older established groups. So I think there's going to be something of a sifting. I think they've got an important role, uh, but it's somewhat unclear at the moment because um, you do have people who have different inclinations. Some want to be directly involved in politics. Some want to be involved in grassroots. Uh, some want to be involved in politics from a remove, endorsing candidates only as opposed to fielding. So I think that's something that's in flux uh, and I will emerge in the, in, the, in the coming months and years. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Uh, Khaled? I, yeah, oh. I can comment. Let me just say that's one comment on Iran. I think when the revolution oh. first occurred, SCAF came out and there was this outreach, if you will, to Iran, pretty um, public <laughs> outreach uh, to Iran. And then what did you see? The United States going ballistic on it. And particularly now, we're seeing a lot of sanctions on the banking industry and full force core press on Iran. What did you see? Backpedal. 
backpedal to the point now where... But, but that, on that point, that was Nabil Arabi. It was a foreign minister. It wasn't SCAF. And that's an important distinction to note. SCAF is very stability oriented. They're not going to be making sudden movements. Nabil Arabi came in, uh, said he was going to open Gaza up, said he wanted official relations with Iran. You know, he's been kicked upstairs to the Arab League now, and I think that's not a coincidence. Um, so, uh, again, with, with, with uh, this new government in Egypt, you'll see less overt hostility to Iran. Uh, you won't get the Mubarak policy, um, but it will be a different, uh, it will be somewhat different, uh, but it's not going to be a warm relationship because Egypt and Iran are strategic competitors in the end. And in the end, the U.S. holds her strings on the money. And that's where it's, that's where it's focused. In the end, it's all about the money. Okay. Yeah. Khaled. Um, my question is on the generation gap. That, that Mike, that you mentioned, and, and that, that I tend to think uh, might be a, uh, <laughs> a key variable to, uh, in, in going forward and in, in how things may end up. Um, the... The, the Brotherhood youth that broke with the Brotherhood uh, early on in this process uh, didn't seem to have much of an impact on... on uh, yeah, it seems. Um, it didn't seem to have much of an impact on the Brotherhood's performance on Election Day. Um, and at the same time, those youth who went and formed, I think it was the current, uh, the current party, um, they didn't seem to do terribly well. On the other hand, I guess my question is, Given the role that the youth have played in general uh, and their potential numbers as a, uh, as a force, politically, potentially, do you believe, does anyone, do, you, do any of you believe that, that their kind of shunning of the electoral process as a whole, although clearly there were exceptions, um, did that have an impact on the liberals' performance or on the, the other groups? Would they, would they have done better um, had there been a much more, you know, active involvement by the youth, at least as the foot soldiers, for example, uh, of some of these campaigns. Okay, well, one more question, uh, gentleman in the back here. Uh, can you wait for the mic? Hi, I'm um, Michael Davis with Universal Human Rights Network, and my question really is to the rule of law group. Um, I, I know that uh, you're serving as advisors uh, to various groups there, but I wonder if um, uh, you're also doing anything to educate uh, legislators here. I think so many in our Congress view Egypt only through the prism of their relationship with Israel and don't have a notion of the aspiration of the Egyptian people. So I'd like to know that. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we'll let the panelists uh, sure. make closing remarks and response. Sure. Great. Um, on your um, answer, uh, no, Erla, the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association's mandate is not to lobby the United States Congress, but um, I will tell you that there is an organization in the works of Egyptian Americans whose purpose will be that particular purpose will be educate lawmakers on that. Um, Khaled, your question uh, certainly is a good one. Um, and I posed this to one of the groups on the ground on Sunday, uh, the shunning of the electoral process. Did that have an impact? Um, by and large, uh, his, his particular opinion was no. That you have to remember the Brotherhood, the Salafists, were well organized for a very long time. Okay, whether it was in education, social aspects, they kept running and running and running and through false sham elections kept losing. But remember, they had practice. Um, what happened after, uh, after the revolution in February, you remember, the U.S. rushed in there with our democracy organizations trying to help the youth organize. And it became difficult because purely we ran out of time. There was no time to teach people how to organize, how to get a party platform together, how to put up candidates. And what they had, they felt like they ran out of time at this point. So um, I just think it was, it, it, even if they decided to vote, I just think they were su in such a disadvantage. They were not able to put people forward and win the seats they did, the ones that they they did win, they did okay on. But remember, too, one thing we're forgetting, I mean, there's going to be term limits here. There's going to be, you know, Parliament's going to serve, I think, right now, the way it's written, what, four years five or something, years. or five years? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know what? It's just going to be sorry. like here, if they don't do their job, they're not going to be elected again. And, you know, that's the beauty, democratic or not, of elections. You don't do your job, people don't vote for you. So maybe in the five years... We can help work on the liberal aspects. We can help the youth organize. Five years is a long time to teach them how to organize and, and get into political campaigns. Um, 
On, on the youth question, I would I would answer somewhat similarly that essentially, you know, electoral politics is all about organization, getting your people out to vote. Brotherhood youth, the kind of the comparative liberal, and were always, I mean, they were frank about this. They were a minority within the brotherhood itself, a small minority within the brotherhood itself, and that wasn't what they were about. Um, so so the, um, uh, the idea that they were kind of going to be, you know, so, sort of taking over the brotherhood, um, um, uh, no, they were they were dealt with uh, fairly firmly. Uh, some of them kicked out of the organization. Um, others of them brought to heel. Some of them uh, some of them leaving. That was never going to make the organization remake the organization short term. And again, with with um, uh, uh, youth in other organizations, the idea that you could sort of instantly create uh, some kind of national political network. I mean, I'm not sure it couldn't have been done, but done, but it would have been very, very difficult to do. And it, my hunch is it probably could have only been done by linking up with uh, strong, already organized constituencies. And the only one that I saw that was available at the time was labor, and nobody did that. Nobody, or, there was no Egyptian labor party that really arose out of this. That would have been the one possibility of people who basically had numbers in organization nationwide. So when that didn't happen, essentially, um, um, uh, no, you go to the you go to the old existing organizations, and then there's two essentially the Salafi networks and, 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 and the Brotherhood. They're the only ones that are able to make the transition. That said, um, that doesn't mean youth don't make a difference, and I would go uh, what, to what Mike said uh, earlier. Um, at, a, at the level of electoral politics, no, there's no real immediate effect of kind of a youth revolution. At a cultural level, my impression, and this is just raw impression from, you know, quick, from three quick trips to Egypt, is, again, this is a different country. There is the, the kind of, of, of deference... Um, that that you talked about is really fraying, um, and you've got younger generations within each Egyptian organization or institution who feel basically that they're living within kind of sometimes within a mini Mubarak regime. Um, and I think there's real pressure for change within the society. You're going to see this expressed not necessarily in the next election, but over the next five or ten years. Yeah, and, and I think it's important. Part of the problem is our frame of reference. I mean, we're still in 2011. You know, you, the 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 Tayyar al Masri, the the current. Uh, I think it's it's a very important thing. I mean, it's a it's a uh, uh, you know, the Brotherhood can still uh, count on many cadres who will not question a thing. Uh, but there are really important voices that have been purged, uh, that have left the left the organization, um, and, and you see that bottom up pressure uh, with people not willing to tolerate internal authoritarianism. You know, top down. Uh, answers, no uh, democratic institutions within the party. And, and I think that's something that's going to play out over time. A and some of the people that have left are important figures. And, and I think um, it's just important to realize that I think this is going to take some time, as this whole transition is. Uh, and, and frankly, in the end, not that many people boycotted elections. And if I could make one last point on, on the Muslim Brotherhood, I do, as opposed to Nathan, I do put a lot of emphasis on the brothers. And I don't think it's unfair. They are by far the most coherent political force in Egypt. They've long wanted these responsibilities. They've groomed themselves through these responsibilities. Their performance in the transition has been disappointing. Uh, and, and I think, um, and that's a problem. Uh, they were the first party to choose, I think, politics over unified political demands. And I think that set in motion a lot of the fragmentation that we saw afterward. Um, their tone on sectarian issues. If you are the main Islamist party wanting to introduce more religion into Egyptian public life, you don't have the opportunity to just take a pass when sectarian strife spikes, when churches are being burnt down. You don't get to say, yes, foreign hands, and that's it. You have a higher responsibility. You're a major political player, and if you want it to be treated as such, you have to act it. And, and I think that's a reasonable position to take. Not scaremongering, um, not sort of rampant fear about the beards, but looking at what they do in Egyptian society and judging them by their political positions, uh, and are they really committed to pluralism? I want to see. They say they are, and, and we'll see in the next months. But um, I don't think it's, it's uh, scare tactics to wonder about that. I think it's an open question. OK. Um, <clears throat> well, I think, uh, obviously, we have a lot more to look forward to in terms of seeing how things unfold in Egypt. I want to thank everyone for coming today. And I want to thank our panelists for shedding light on uh, the situation and, and hope we can continue having discussions um, as things, uh, you know, looking forward to um, 2015 and beyond in terms of Egypt's transition. Thank you very much.